Welcome to Worship from Creef on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. It's a year ago this Sunday that church buildings across Scotland were closed in order to limit the possible spread of the COVID virus. And so our worship had to spread and switch to other forms. And here in Creef, we moved to our worship online. And I well remember a year ago the, the sense of panic that I felt and many of my colleagues felt. Just how do we do this? Well, it's been hard work, but I hope worth the effort allowing us to maintain something of our local worshipping presence as the church, knowing that we have come together online over these past 12 months and over the phone as well with others in our congregation. And the really good news is that next Sunday, Palm Sunday, and also on Easter Sunday, God willing, we'll be able to begin meeting again in person, at least a small number of us, with others joining online. So our service next Sunday will still be online as we've done over the past 12 months, but it will also be the service from the St Andrews building. And if you are able to come in person, I'd love you to be there. It'd be really great to see as many as we can get in. Of course, we're still limited in numbers, numbers that we can accommodate safely, and we still can't sing together if we're in the building, but if you'd like to be there, it will be possible. So that we can manage the numbers and arrange the seats, you'll still be required to book a seat. You do that on our website, going to creefparishchurch.org forward slash booking, and you give your names and your contact details. If and only if you're unable to get online on the website to do that, you can also phone the manse and I'll add you to that online booking system. But please, please do it online if you can. Please book between Monday, that's tomorrow, and Friday morning for th this following Sunday. And please don't just turn up hoping to get in because it could be that we're full and we don't want to be having to turn you away. So at this stage, you must register in advance if you're hoping to come for worship in person in the St Andrews building. We will make sure that all the safety precautions are in place. We only ask you to be free of any COVID symptoms or any other health issues. You'll need to, of course, wear a mask, a face covering, and the seating will be arranged so that everyone's, or every household is two metres apart. And we'll ask you to stay in that seat throughout the service and to respect other people's space. Please don't be leaning over and going up to folks and chatting with them. So that's our plan for Palm Sunday, and for Easter Sunday. Look forward to that, these services. Now, over the past few weeks, we have been somewhat time shifting the church calendar a wee bit to allow us to spend more time looking at the monumental events between these two Sundays, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And if you were joining in worship with us last week, you'll remember that on our journey from Christmas to the cross, we had reached the upper room in Jerusalem. That place where Jesus and his disciples went and shared a final meal together. That supper, in all likelihood, would have ended with a hymn. Possibly, probably, Psalm 115, Psalm 116, which ends with a, a hallel, a praise the Lord. And so, with that as ascription of praise, the meal also ended. And then Jesus and his disciples, though now without Judas, would have left the upper room, walked back through the Golden Gate out of the city, across the Kidron Valley and into an orchard called Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, where they had likely often spent the night. But of course, this night was to be very, very different. Having already in the upper room prayed for himself, for the disciples and for future believers, for the truth, the holiness, the mission, the unity of the church. It was here now in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus again turned to his father in prayer. And here the gospel writers tell us that Jesus experienced the agony of distress, which helps us to understand what he was about to suffer on the cross. This time in the garden, that evening was the beginning of the ordeal, in which he was successively betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, 
put on trial before the Sanhedrin, before Herod, before Pilate, all of which led to the terrible mocking and scourging at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Why did Jesus go through this ordeal and the awful events that followed? Well, quite simply, he did it for you and for me, that our sins may be forgiven, that our relationship with his heavenly Father, which went so wrong in another garden way back in Genesis 2, might be put right. We'll be taking a look at that this morning. But first, as we come into one another's presence, as we come before God, let's bring our praise in song as we sing, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Luke chapter 22 Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. 
and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion, that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Then, seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cock crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. If you were to be able to visit Jerusalem today and stand on the hillside opposite the, city, the old city of Jerusalem looking across the Kidron Valley, you would see the walls around the old city, the now bricked up golden gate through which Jesus entered into the city on that first Palm Sunday. And beyond these ancient walls you would see the Temple Mount now dominated by the Dome of the Rock near the site of Solomon's Temple. It's built over the rock that's reported to be the place where Abraham sacrificed a ram in substitution for his son Isaac. At the foot of the hillside that you're standing on you would find a small olive grove that is preserved and it's on every tourist and every pilgrim's checklist for there on the Mount of Olives is a place of great resonance in Christianity, the Garden of Gethsemane. And according to the Gospel writers, it was a place where Jesus and his disciples often visited when they were in and around Jerusalem. That word Gethsemane means oil press in Aramaic, the language that Jesus would have spoken. And here today, in this Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Oil Press, there are eight extremely old, extremely gnarled olive trees that have been preserved. They're representative of what must have been a much bigger olive grove covering the hillside. Now, olive trees can live for hundreds and hundreds of years. Back in 2012, three of these eight olive trees in that garden were identified amongst the oldest known to mankind. They were radiocarbon dated to at least 900 years old. And so while their narrow trunks and branches are, are not exactly the same trunks and branches which sheltered Jesus and the disciples, they in fact could be the same trees because olive trees can grow back from the roots. 
And in fact, the other five trees in that garden are so old, so hollowed out and decayed inside with only newer growth remaining on the outside that they could not be properly carbon dated. All eight trees in that garden share the same DNA. It looks like they've come from the same parent plants. It looks like they've been preserved in a deliberate attempt to pass on a precious heritage for future generations. Now the idea of a new tree growing from an old root may remind you of the words that we find in the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, which speak of a shoot coming up from the stump of Jesse and the promise of a messianic king who would be born of David's family line. What would seem to be dead, buried in the ground, would burst forth into new life. And so, in a sense, even these ancient, gnarled olive trees themselves point to Jesus' death on the cross and to his glorious resurrection. While we cannot say for certain that these are the same trees or this is the exact location referred to in the Gospels, just a few months ago, in December 2020, Archaeological evidence was found there of a Second Temple era ritual bath. The kind of bath that the disciples and Jesus must have used prior to going into Jerusalem and eating the Last Supper together. Remember during that meal, Jesus said to Peter, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet. And inscribed near that bath, remains of that bath that they found are the words for the memory and the repose of the lovers of Christ. Accept the offering of your servants and give them remission of sins. So from very, very early times, this site, this Garden of Gethsemane, was identified as a place of Christian pilgrimage. And it was here in this olive orchard that Jesus' agony in prayer provides us with a vivid example of the paradox of his person. On the one hand, we see his human hunger for companionship and for prayer support of his friends, together with the recognition that his will could be distinct from his father's will. Remember, he said, yet not my will but yours be done. We still have that same desire for companionship in prayer as we gather week by week uh, for our congregational prayer time. But on the other hand, even in the midst of his pain, Jesus spoke to God in the unique intimacy of the address, Abba, Father. And when Jesus prayed that the cup might be taken from him, he was overcome with distress and anguish. He was horrified. His heart was ready to break with grief. And in his gospel, Luke adds with his medical interest that Jesus' sweat was like drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, what was so overwhelming? What was this overwhelming cup? Was it simply death? Well, Luke helps us to understand that the cup was something more than physical, for there was a spiritual battle going on, and right there at Gethsemane that battle was being waged. And as happened at the end of the temptations at the start of Jesus' ministry, when he spent these 40 days and nights in the wilderness, again an angel appeared and strengthened him. For the cup was neither the physical pain of crucifixion nor the mental anguish or desertion of his friends, but it was the spiritual horror of bearing the sins of the world. Now in the Old Testament, the cup was a regular symbol of God's wrath. It's repeated again and again. And so too, at the, the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, where the cup is filled with the fierceness of God's wrath against sin, against evil, against rebellion. 
Isaiah the prophet describes Jerusalem after its destruction as having drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. And so the vividness of this cup in Jesus' mind must have been heightened by the memory of the meal he had just shared with his disciples in that upper room where he had offered them the cup of the new covenant and they'd just sung in all likelihood from Psalm 115 and 16, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Here in the garden, that psalm was being enacted. And although John in his gospel does not include an account of Gethsemane, he does include a saying that the other evangelists don't. He writes, Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Words from Jesus. You see, when we look to Scripture, the cup of wrath is completely and absolutely bound up with the cup of salvation. The wrath of God against the sin of the world, your sin, my sin, the sin that came in at the start of the story in Genesis, was being poured into that cup. The cup of wrath consumed by Jesus, which becomes the cup of salvation offered to you and to me and to all who confess their sin and turn to the Lord who alone can bring healing and forgiveness. Coming out of his ordeal in the olive grove of Gethsemane, Jesus is clear in his mind that there is no alternative to the cross and he has surrendered to it in his will. What shall I say? He asks. Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. From the agony of the garden, Jesus emerged with a resolute determination to go to the cross. He is ready for the next stage in the drama and the ordeal was set to escalate. A couple of weeks ago, you might remember that we had a little insight into the motivation of Judas. The evangelists focus on Judas' love of money. John, for instance, tells us he was the treasurer of the apostolic band and that he was a thief, helping himself to the contents of their common purse, dipping into it for his own benefit. It's no wonder that Judas was so horrified by Mary's lavish extravagance when she poured out a whole year's worth of wages in that perfume. And Judas seems to have gone straight to the priests after that incident in order to try to recoup some of the loss that he himself was no doubt feeling. He bargained with them and he settled on 30 silver coins, the ransom price of a common slave, barely a third of the value of that precious perfume. While the early church certainly saw the betrayal of Jesus by Judas as fulfilment of scripture, and that it took place after Satan had prompted and then entered into him. Neither the biblical prophecy nor the satanic influence took away any of the personal responsibility Judas had for his action. At the last minute, in the upper room, as they shared that meal, Jesus had made a final appeal to Judas. But when he rejected that appeal, Jesus then said, Woe! to the man who betrays the Son of Man. There is nothing that you and I can do to absolve ourselves from the personal responsibility that we bear for the sin in our lives. That cup of wrath is truly ours to drink and yet the Bible tells us that if we are in Christ, then that cup becomes the cup of salvation. Jesus' blood poured out on the cross 
that the sin of many might be forgiven. It's at this point in the Garden of Gethsemane, named after the oil that is crushed out of the fruit of the olive tree, that Judas returns to the story. Gethsemane was, after all, a place that he had often gone with Jesus and the other disciples, and so it was not at all hard for Jesus to, to work out where Jesus was and to find him, even though he had left the upper room before the end of the meal. This time when he arrived in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was accompanied by a, a detachment of armed soldiers sent by the, high, the chief priests. And giving the prearranged signal of a kiss, Judas' betrayal is complete. The Bible tells us that Jesus' only protest at that time was that he was not leading a, a rebellion, but that he had been teaching daily in the temple courts where they could have arrested him at any time. You see, even now, Jesus puts himself deliberately under the authority of the Old Testament scriptures. You remember that at Caesarea Philippi, Peter could not accept the concept of a Messiah who would suffer and die. And so now we read that Peter takes decisive action. He draws a sword and he slashes away and, and cuts the, the right ear of the high priest servant Malchus. Telling Peter to sheath his sword, Jesus adds, Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But Peter, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? You see, Jesus knew that he must be betrayed, arrested, rejected, condemned, and ultimately killed. Why? Do these things take place? Because the scripture says so.
Luke chapter 22 The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You say that I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Luke chapter 23 Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him, and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! And Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So we've seen that Jesus' ordeal began at Gethsemane. But over the course of that night and throughout the next day and the next evening, it lengthened as he endured a series of, of trials before Annas, Caiaphas, Herod and Pilate, as well as beatings and torture and other abuse at the hands of the soldiers. First, we read that Jesus was taken straight from Gethsemane to a late night 
informal and preliminary hearing concocted by the Jewish leaders and chaired by Annas, who we are told was an ex-high priest and the current high priest Caiaphas, his father-in-law. Jesus was interrogated about his followers and his teaching, but he declined to answer their questions, the questions they put to him, on the grounds that his words and deeds were already well known. Early the following morning, Jesus was brought before a plenary session of the Sanhedrin, which was the supreme court responsible for the political, legal and religious affairs in Jerusalem. Now, the purpose of this meeting was to put together an accusation against Jesus that could be submitted to the Roman court presided over by the governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate would not be interested in some trivial ecclesiastical offences against the Jewish law, but only in some revolutionary claim that might threaten public security in a city already bursting with fervent travellers gathered to celebrate the Passover and the rest of the festival of unleavened bread. The accusation had to be something big, really big, huge. So Caiaphas, who as high priest presided over these meetings of the Sanhedrin, directly challenged Jesus on whether he was the Messiah. And in a sense, this was the point of no return. Though Jesus had been resolute at each stage of his life's journey. In response to this direct question, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed one? Remember, they would never speak the name of God. Jesus does that very thing. He affirms, I am. And suddenly, the whole Jewish history from the moment that Moses first heard that voice speaking from the burning bush, speaking the name of God, that whole history comes rushing into the gathering. The force must have been enormous as it hit and to make sure that there was no doubt in the minds of the Sanhedrin as to what they had just heard. Jesus went on to quote from Daniel 7 and Psalm 110 as these verses were fulfilled in him, claiming to have universal dominion and to share the throne of God. I am, he said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. It's no wonder that Caiaphas accused him of blasphemy and so deserving death. Meanwhile, down in the courtyard, below the place they were gathering, Peter was sitting, having fled from Gethsemane with the other disciples. He's sitting in the courtyard, he's warming himself by the fire. Perhaps Peter thought that the courtyard of the high priest would be the, the last place they would think to look for him. But just as Jesus had earlier predicted, Peter now denied knowing Jesus. And he disowned Jesus three times. Only then, as dawn was breaking, to hear the cock crow twice, just as Jesus said. You can only imagine the look that must have been exchanged as Jesus was led out past Peter. Peter denied Jesus. But Jesus, while refusing to answer frivolous questions, courageously affirmed his messiahship before the highest Jewish court in the land. Over the course of the next day, Jesus was brought before Pilate, who, trying to shift the responsibility, then sent Jesus to Herod, who, finding no basis for any charge against him, sent Jesus back to Pilate. And then Pilate would really try to do the right thing, releasing Jesus. But he tried to do it for the wrong reasons, because of a Passover custom. He tried to free Jesus because of clemency instead of it being an act of justice. 
Then Pilate tried to appease the crowds with half measures, having Jesus brutally flogged instead of being crucified. And finally, Pilate tried to persuade the crowd of his own integrity by ritually washing his hands in public while contradicting his own integrity by sending Jesus to die on the cross. Pilate made the wrong choice. He chose to be a friend of Caesar and an enemy of all reason and justice. His name immortalized in the creed which declares that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. So who ultimately was responsible for Jesus' death? At different times in history, Christians have been accused of anti-Semitism because it is alleged that we fasten the blame of Jesus' death onto the Jews, especially the Jewish leaders. But the responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus is spread much, much more widely than a single group of people. The Gospel writers make it clear that Judas, the priests, Pilate, the crowd and the soldiers all played a significant part. And there is motivation in each case. Judas was motivated by greed. The priests were motivated by envy. Pilate was motivated by fear. The crowds were, were whipped up and motivated by, by hysteria. And the soldiers were motivated by callous duty. And in fact, that same mixture of sin is something that we, if we're honest, recognise in ourselves. But that's only the human side of the story. For Jesus insisted that his death was a voluntary act on his part, so that he handed himself over to it. No one, he said, takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And then finally, there's one passage in which the divine and the human aspects of Jesus' death are brought together. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, a reaffirmed and forgiven Peter preached to the same crowds in Jerusalem. This man, he said, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death. Here, on the day of Pentecost, the death of Jesus is attributed equally to the purpose of God and to human wickedness. No attempt is made to resolve the paradox because in fact both statements are true. At the cross where every sin was laid on Christ, the ordeal reached its summit and the cup of wrath was transformed to be the cup of blessing for all who will believe. My strength, my song, this cornerstone 
the solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the ground This coming Tuesday brings us to the anniversary of the first lockdown on the 23rd of March 2020. And on Tuesday I have no doubt that we will join with folks throughout these island nations to keep a silence and to reflect on all that has happened over these past 12 months. 
and to acknowledge the profound impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had upon us personally and communally. For in one way or another, all of us have felt the impact of these times. For all of us have faced restrictions. Some of us or those in our families have been ill. Some folks that we have known and loved are just no longer with us in this earthly life. And the numbers that we hear day by day are huge and sadly they are still growing. And even though some folks, uh, as I experienced this week, have received a vaccine, we must continue to keep one another safe. We must keep doing all the, the safety things that we've been maintaining over these past 12 months. For there is no other way to get through this. Lives are still being lost. Other lives are being changed forever. And behind each number that is recorded and each number we hear on our news bulletins, there lies a person whose life is known to God and who is mourned by those who have loved them. In their passing, we are the poorer. In the remembrance of a life given by God, we are the richer. The writer to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament records that in the days of his flesh Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and, and with tears. Jesus is called to take the place of the one who offers prayers on behalf of us all and he does so with cries and with tears because he himself has suffered. Jesus shares in the suffering of the world and brings the suffering of the world before God, our Heavenly Father. So in all our reflections at this time, we remember the one who prayed for us in the days of his flesh and who even now lives to pray with us once more. So let us come before God, our Father, in prayer. And let us share in prayer with the Lord Jesus. Living God, in whose image we are made, hear us, we ask, through your Son who prays for us. Hear us as we recall all we have endured in the different communities and nations of these islands over the 12 months that have passed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, who knows us in all our suffering, hear us, we ask, through your Son, who prays for us. Hear us as we reflect wherever we are and remember those who have suffered the deepest loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, whose name is love, Hear us, we ask, through your Son who prays for us. Hear us as we reach out our hand to those who suffer still and stand with them in the face of all that is to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God who gives good gifts to all creation, Hear us, we ask, through your Son who prays for us. Hear us as we give thanks for those who, in hospital and in care home, have cared for the dying and for the sick. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, who inspires hope, hear us, we ask, through your Son who prays for us. Hear us as we acknowledge and give thanks for those who have advised and for those who have steered us through these past 12 difficult months. Hear us as we acknowledge and give thanks for all who have worked hard to create and distribute the vaccines that now give hope to the peoples of many nations throughout the world. May there be a just and equitable distribution. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Living God who gives light to the world even in the face of darkness. Hear us, we ask, through your Son who prays for us. Hear us as we bow in the presence of the one who in the days of his flesh shed tears for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and hear us as we pray together the words given to his friends by Jesus. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Well, next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we continue our journey from Christmas to the cross. And we come to the event of the crucifixion. Although every Sunday is, of course, a celebration of the resurrection. A whole year after our churches closed across Scotland, God willing, our service will come from the St Andrew's building. Now numbers and what we can safely do are still limited, so I remind you if you'd like to attend that service in person, please book a place on our church website, creefparishchurch.org forward slash booking. Leave your name and some contact details so that we can assure you of a place. Of course, our services will continue to be available online and recordings will be available afterwards as podcasts and also recordings that you can hear over the phone. You can also join with other folk in our congregation for our prayer time each Monday evening between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. Again, there's a link for this online prayer time on our website, creefparishchurch.org forward slash prayer. And you can also join in that time over the phone. So if you'd like to do that, then please contact me for the details. Until then, may the blessing of God, the ever-present Father, the ever-living Son, the ever-active Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>